Good morning, Kingdom Arise Church. How is everyone doing today? Fantastic, wonderful, and amazing. That's what we're doing. So I just pray that everyone's got their Jesus, they got their Java, they've already prayed, the worship has just been amazing. Some of you guys are just touching up your makeup because you're weeping and it's just powerful. Or, or you're just so happy that you're crying. I, I hope it's the second part. That you're just so happy that you're crying, that God is good, and, and, and it's just amazing. With that being said, I want to welcome you guys to another amazing Sunday with the Word, with the Word of God. And with that, we're going to continue to pick up the Word with the good news in the book of Mark. We are still in Mark, and we are in Mark 10, verse 10, or chapter 10, I'm sorry. And with that being said, before we jump into Mark, before we talk anymore, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this time that you continue to speak to us, deposit in us, Lord. Let us have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to his church, what he's saying to his sons and daughters across the face of the earth, Lord. Wake us up. Cause us to arise and step into a boldness that the kingdom requires, a humility that you exemplify, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we just thank you right now, Lord. I ask that I would... Uh, I would, I would be, uh, I would, you would diminish my personality, that I would, that you would be maximized, marginalize me, uh, minimize me, that's the word, minimize me, Lord, and I want you to be maximized. Remove me from the equation. Remove me. Let it be the Spirit of God. Let it be the voice from the very throne room of heaven that releases, imparts, and transforms the lives of people on the face of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. I got tongue-tied, and I know you heard me in the prayer. So that lets you know that sometimes when you pray, you're going to get tongue-tied, and you're going to forget a word, or you can't find a word. It's all right. Just pick another word up and just keep on going. With that being said, the word we are studying today is in Mark 10. We're going to start with the rich young ruler, and we're going to continue with Jesus and his disciples. So here we go. 10, 17. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him. And asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But at these words he was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the, children, the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Amen. So all things, guys, just a little side note, all things are possible with God. Amen. So make that little note in your notepad, in your book, in your journal. What a beautiful scripture to open with, the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, because the rich young ruler really, it causes us to really explore our motives, explore what we value, identify what we value, and at the same time, make sure that God is preeminent, that he comes before all things to make sure that we really put him where he belongs. He is seated at the throne room of heaven, but he needs to be in the throne room of our lives as well. He needs to be on the throne, not ourselves, but him. 17, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him. So he was running, right? And knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So this guy's all happy. He's like a, a young pup, right? He's just like full of uh, energy and he's excited. And all of a sudden he gets to Jesus. He runs up to him. He kneels before him. And he's like, boom, what do I do to, etern- to enjoy or enter into eternal life? Uh, 18, and Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. At this point, we're, 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 we're searching or God is searching because 
Christ at this time, it's not been revealed that he's the Messiah to this person. So only God is good. Man inherently is not good by default. And so because of that, he's like, hey, what are you trying to say? What are you calling me? And he continues on. 19, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. 20, and he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. Look, and, okay, we're going to stop there. So this guy had been good. He'd been a good student. He'd been a good son. He'd been a good steward. He'd, he'd really, he crossed every T. He's dotted every I in his life up until this point. He had given himself like a, a nice little, little silver star, gold star sticker like they do in a kindergarten. So he was very proud of himself. He was happy with his performance and he was very confident of his qualifications to enter into eternal life. And so then he meets Jesus, and Jesus sets him straight. Because eternal life is not something you can do on your own. Here we go. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. You know, it's so beautiful. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. I love that about Jesus because Jesus is always moved with what? Compassion. He always had love in him. His heartbeat was his father's heartbeat. It was the heartbeat of heaven. It was to see people saved. It was to see people come to enter into the kingdom of God. And he said, you know what? There's just one thing, man. It's not even that big a deal. There's just one thing. He says, you have to sell everything you have, everything you possess, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. So he I really love it because I don't think he was really asking him to sell everything. I, he want, what, what God wanted, what God continually wants even today is for us to put him first. We have to put God first. God cannot just be part of everything you do. He has to be at the center of everything you do. He has to be the first thing, the first consideration, the first audience, the first thought, the first filter of our lives. God has to be first. So when this, obviously, this young gentleman, uh, being very proud, being very uh, educated, uh, well-mannered, um, he had come and found a lot of security in his resource. And what God wanted him to do is for him to submit and fall in love and depend on the source. What's the source? The kingdom of God. If it's always going to be your strength, your wisdom, your ability, your resources, then you don't need God. But you and I all know that everybody needs God. And so God said, let's go ahead and let's take your wealth from here and let's store it up what in heaven. How do we do that? By blessing people, by being selfless and not selfish, by trying to bless other people, not expecting to be blessed back, but just knowing that there's treasure stored up in heaven. Amen? And then he said, come, follow me. So at no, at no point in this dialogue that Christ has with this rich young ruler does he say, uh, you're disqualified. Does he say, don't follow me? He actually says, and come follow me. That's a command. Like, come follow me. Like, let's go. Like, wait for, waiting for it. Like, don't waste any more time. Like, let's get it. 22, but at these words, he was saddened. We're not talking about Jesus. Another translation says, he became gloomy and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. He's like, you can have everything, Jesus, except my money. <laughs> you can have everything, Jesus, except my natural inheritance. How amazing is that, that this gentleman could not give up his natural inheritance at the cost of his eternal inheritance. Be careful, brother and sister. Be careful, believer. Be careful, Christian, that you put things before God that you sabotage, that you sell your birthright, just like Esau did with Jacob, right? He comes back from hunting and he's hungry and Esau approaches Jacob. He says, Jacob, you know what? I want a bowl of soup, man. I am so hungry. I am so parched. It's, you know, it's been a long day in the heat. I've been sweating. I'm dirty. I stink and I'm hungry. You can even hear my stomach growling. And Jacob says, sure. <laughs> just sell me your inheritance. Give me your inheritance. And his brother Esau, thinking with his stomach and not with his mind, not with his heart, says, sure, I'll give you my inheritance. Little did he know what he was giving away. 
I believe that there's some Christians today that are living lives of compromise and they're giving things away. They're giving away blessings. They're giving away opportunities. They're giving away power and authority. Ultimately, they're giving away or they're compromising their identity. There's so many of us that want the full blessing of God, but we, we continue to compromise. We continue to, to negotiate. We continue to wrestle like Jacob did, right? We continue to try to, to say, well, God, I'll give you this, but you got to give me that. And the reality is, is that there's a place in the kingdom where God can't just be part of your life. He has to be at the center. And the reality is, is that there's a principle. It's a principle called first fruits. It's a biblical principle. And in it, it was about people redeeming the, the first of everything they had. And so what, what was the whole point of giving the first? The idea of first was that it was putting God first. And it's so important that as Christians, we learn the principle of first fruits. We have to put God first. We are not driving the car. He is driving the car. How many times in life as Christians do we say, hey, God, you know what? I got this, dude. Just sit down in the front seat and you can just watch. Enjoy the view. Enjoy the scenery. And I'll let you know when we get where we need to go. Other times we put God in the back seat and we say, just be quiet and just fall asleep. Take a nap and we'll get there. And other times we forget to invite him into the car at all. And so we have to be so careful in our humanity that we don't become like the, the rich young ruler, that we, we, we neglect the blessing of God. We neglect the identity of God, and we, and, we, and we put it down instead of picking it up. The Bible says we're called to what? Pick up our crosses daily. So every day, it is going to be a struggle. I don't think anywhere in anyone's mind Picking up a cross seems enjoyable. It does not seem like a fun thing to do. I don't know if you've done your homework, but crosses in the time of Christ weighed anywhere from 300 to 350 pounds. That's what a physical cross weighed. If I told you to pick up a cross, you would tell me, go fly a kite. <laughs> you can imagine, and that wood is not refined wood. It's not like wood you got at Lowe's or Dixie Line or at Home Depot. This wasn't soft, smooth, sanded down wood. This is some rough wood that's on a cross. This wood is heavy and cumbersome. I believe that most crosses were anywhere from 12 to 16 feet in length. Imagine picking up a cross. How easy would that be? Ideally, you don't even pick up the cross. You're actually dragging the cross. And so the reality is, is that for all of us as Christians, we have to understand that there is, a, there is pain, but there's also purpose. That there is going to be trials and tribulations. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, at the end of the age, Christ has already given us the victory. So pick up your cross anyway. You know, the rich young ruler is not like, unlike us today, that so many of us continue to try, like I said, to negotiate our blessing, negotiate with God, rationalize with God. I'll, I'll serve you on Mondays, but Tuesdays, I need those for me. Wednesdays, you can have those back, and Thursdays, I'm picking it back up. And God says, no, I want all of your life, not just some of your life. I, died, I gave all of my blood, not just some of my blood, on the cross for you and me. How beautiful is that? And so we continue to see the love of God, and we see the, the disappointment of our flesh. 22, but at these words, he was saddened, the rich young ruler, and in the other translation, it says, and he became gloomy. That means his shoulders went down. He went from going like, to, and he walked off. Instead of running up to Jesus, he walked off, and he was kicking the dirt. I'm sure he's kicking his shoes. And he was basically deciding that eternity wasn't for him. And he went away grieving, which means he was very sad, for he was one who owned much property. He could not break, he could not cut loose from the idea of his plan, of his process, of his natural inheritance, of his natural success. Part of becoming a Christian is allowing God to make all things new. What a beautiful thing it is that the sacrament of baptism. You know that you, you, you enter into the water, right? The water being symbolic of the Holy Spirit. You enter into the water and you go down and you identify yourself with what? Not just the body of Christ, but with Jesus Christ, with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So as you come out of the water, the Bible says all things are made new. So there's a newness in you. There's a newness in spirit. There's a newness in expectation. There's a newness in service. There's a newness in living that comes out as you come out of that water. And so the reality is, is that you and I, we have to realize that there's a newness in Christ. And that newness is worth the way of us picking up our crosses because we've already won. So the reality is, is that as he was saddened because he could not give up his wealth, 
naturally, you and I are blessed because we're speaking today. We're dialoguing today. We're having conversation today because we've already are positioned in entering into eternal inheritance. So we're not the rich young ruler. Unfortunately, Scripture doesn't even say if you get saved or doesn't get saved, and that doesn't really matter. But the struggle is real. I think that sometimes as Christians, we don't realize that. We want to say that life is easy and that, you know, it's a bouquet of roses and you get your bonbons and you get to eat all the calories you want and you never gain weight and you always will stay young. That's not true. There's going to be bills. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be disappointments. There's going to be sacrifices. There's going to be aches and pains. There's going to, for some, there will be disease. For some, there's going to be broken marriages. For some, there's going to be all these different challenges. Welcome to humanity. Welcome to the life that Christ had to walk. It's okay. I think for a lot of us, we struggle. Some of it's necessary, and a lot of it's unnecessary. You know, the reality is, as a Christian, we will all be subject and experience spiritual warfare. The question that I believe we each have to ask ourselves is, is, do, is there extra warfare, is there unnecessary warfare that we're allowing into our lives? Is there unnecessary relationships and thoughts and compromises and behaviors that are creating more baggage, that are making it harder for us to pick up our crosses. And so we have to lay those at the foot of Jesus, at the foot of the cross, and say, Lord, we put it under the blood of Jesus. Give us your strength to resurrect. Give us your strength to arise. Give us that dunamis power, right? The dunamis power is a glory light power. It's that Shekinah glory power of God to see, experience the newness and speak life and experience what God can do. He can make all things possible. Amen? 23. And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard will it be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? That's so true. Continuing on, 24, because it's not done. It's an incomplete thought. I can't stop. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them. It's funny because these guys weren't even, they weren't even talking to Jesus, but he was reading their body language, right? He was watching them, and he already was, he was, he was engaging with their posture, and he was responding without them asking a question. He said, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I was always perplexed when I first read that scripture that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. There's two meanings to this. If you, it, biblically or, or theologically or, or geographically, the truth is, is that in the actual city of Jerusalem, there is a gate and it's called the needle gate. There is an actual needle gate. And if you actually will, will uh, look in, uh, you Google it, you will see the needle gate actually shows how they have to open up the special door and a camel has to bend its legs and scoot into this very small doorway to enter into the city. So the needle gate is real and it is very difficult to get a camel through the crazy needle gate. Not impossible though, but difficult. And so it's interesting that, it, he, that Christ is using an actual real analogy Every person that was in Jerusalem, every person that was from that region knew of the, what? Needle gate. So they also had camels, camels and, and burros, right? Donkeys, those were the primary methods of transportation. And if you're really wealthy, you probably had some stallions. But camels were the primary beast of burden. And so people were very aware that if you had to go to any gate to get into Jerusalem, the needle gate was not the way to go. And so what he was letting them know is that it was challenging based off the culture, challenging based off tradition. And so it goes on and says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle for a rich, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. 26, they were even more astonished and said to him, well, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but with God for all, for all things are possible with God. How amazing is that? So in your own goodness, in your own strength, you can't cut the mustard. You and I can't do it. We cannot do it alone, and we cannot do it independent of God. Salvation is impossible, but a gift from God and God alone. How beautiful that gift of God. How painful and how, how challenging. And, and the reality is, is that as we, as we continue to explore Scripture, uh, chapters 8, 9, and 10 continue to 
Christ continues to share and explain repeatedly the suffering that he has to go through. It was a high cost. It was a high price that Christ had to pay so that we could inherit the kingdom of God. And it goes on and talks about the difficulty to be wealthy in the natural and very easy to be bankrupt in the spirit. You know, when you're rich, you have a lot of options. When you're poor, I'm not saying poor spirit, I'm financially poor, there's less options, there's less distractions. Oftentimes, uh, if you will study revivals, if you'll study the move of God on the earth, oftentimes you'll find that miracle signs and wonders are in the most desperate places. They spring up in the, in the craziest places, in the loneliest, in the most isolated places. Why? Because there isn't a lot of wealth and there's not a lot of distraction. There isn't a, a lot of luxury and indulgence. So in third world countries, not to say that they're less than, but the reality is their need of and their distraction from God is less. The hard thing about being in a wealthy country like America is it's so easy for us to get distracted. It's so easy for us to get addicted. It's so easy for us to get medicated. It's so easy for us to get consumed and to feed our flesh, to feed our lives, to get fat psychologically, to get fat emotionally, to get fat relationally, to get fat in so many places to where we're so full that our flesh, our souls starve. And so we have to see the challenge of a rich man or a wealthy person entering the kingdom of God. Why? First and foremost, they have to break their natural inheritance and they have to pick up and submit and surrender to God's supernatural inheritance. And it does not mean that you don't have to have wealth. God doesn't want every Christian to be broke and he doesn't want them to be homeless. He doesn't want them without. But the reality is, is if God isn't first and foremost in our lives, whether rich or poor, whether in between, it doesn't matter. God has to be first. We have to surrender it. Nothing, not wealth, not a relationship, not a child, nothing can come before God. Amen? 27, looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God. Say, not with God. For all things are possible with God. Highlight that scripture, that it would be Mark 10, 27. Make that one of your life verses. Make that a reminder every day that things that seem so impossible in the natural are possible with God. That you're not limited to the reality of the rich young ruler, but you are, rea- you, you, are, you are released into and you have access to the unlimited and untapped potential of the kingdom of God because of a person named Jesus Christ. How beautiful is that? Continuing on, I want to take us to verse 28, 10, 28. Peter continues on in this dialogue, in this banter with Christ. Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you, Jesus. Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for your gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. That is such a weighty scripture. I'm just going to repeat it and then we'll, we'll start with 28. 31. But many who are first will be last and the last first. That is probably one of the most challenging but most concise descriptions of a Christian life. That everything that you want to be first in line for, God says you have to take the back of the line. That if you really, if your heart is reprogrammed and realigned with my heart, then you don't need all the attention. You want to give me the attention. You're not concerned with what you need. You're concerned with meeting my needs. The reality is, is that you take the lower position And you understand, you enter into the blessing of the kingdom of God. Because in the kingdom, the first will be last. The rich, the person consumed with their flesh, the person consumed with addiction, the person consumed with with their sin will be last. And the person that surrenders their sin and gives it to God and enters the freedom of God will be first. It's not about pedigree. It's not about qualifications. It's about the blood of Jesus. Amen? 28. 28. 
Peter began to say to him, behold, we have left everything. So Peter's, Peter, in, in all of this tension, trying to understand the, the rich young ruler and trying to understand all the sacrifices that all these disciples are making that they continue to make every day with Jesus, he begins to tell him, behold, we have left everything. And some of you guys today, God is asking you to let, leave everything behind. And some of you today have, are already telling God, You've already, I've already given you everything. And God says there's more. And followed you, 29. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for my God, or for the gospel's sake, the good news. 30. But, or if not, that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age at this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and farms, along with persecutions. Don't forget that, guys. Persecution comes with the territory. Don't be scared. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last. The reality is, is that Christ was not naive. He was not unaware of the sacrifices. The sacrifices that the gospel will ask you to make. The sacrifices or the seeming sacrifices that God asked you to make or requires you to make. The reality is, is that all scripture is, is for your good. It's for our good. The Bible is, is a romance novel. It's a love affair. It's God's active and proactive and eternal pursuit with the heart of man. He wants to heal us. He wants to bring us home. He wants to reconcile us. He reconciled us. The question is whether we'll receive the reconciliation. I love it because in the natural, it seems like we're losing everything. But in the spirit, if we just had eyes to see and ears to hear, we have everything. It starts in the spirit. You know, it's interesting because um, a long time ago, I learned that everything is birthed twice. First in the spirit and then in the natural. What does that mean? That means that every time that you walk and you live and you have a thought, that thought was first released in the spirit. That thought first happened in heaven. Something was shifting in the, in the invisible realm, in the unseen realm, and now it's coming to pass in the natural. We have to understand as much as we know, we really don't know that much at all. God's ways are higher than our ways. They're further, deeper, longer. They're eternal. But the question is, or the understanding we have to have is understand that there's consequences, there's weight to everything we do. Anything you sacrifice for God is you sowing treasure in heaven. It's you allowing God to chip away at your life. You know, Scripture says that, though, that Christ is the vine, right? And his dad is the vine dresser. And we're, and we're the branches. And it says that those who are fruitful, that, that, that they get pruned. That they get pruned, they get cut away. And I studied uh, vine as it pertains to, to vineyards, and I've shared this, I think, like, I don't know, four or five months ago, with the church, that the vine gets cut back up to 70% every year or every other year. So there's times where the vine gets cut back a lot. So there's, there's relationships where you feel like they're being cut out of your life. Maybe there's a car, maybe there's a friend, there's a hobby, there's a relationship, there's something you like, there's a food. I don't know what it is. That God says, I got to take it from you. And you're like, but why? It'll make sense later. Just know that anything that God asked you to give up is because he wants to bless you even more. I know it doesn't feel like it. Sometimes it doesn't see, you can't see it and you can't feel it. But God is still at work. And with God, all things are possible. So I love the fact that Peter, along with the disciples, because Peter at this point is like the spokesman for the disciples. He's like, Jesus, do you realize the price that we're paying? And the, the interesting part of all of that is in all of that, <laughs> Jesus continues to tell Peter, do you know the price I'm about to pay? That's what Peter doesn't realize. Peter, you and I, disciples then and disciples now, you and I, Christians, the price that all of us have to pay is nothing compared to the price of the cross. Nothing compared to the price that Jesus had to pay. And we have to really get God's perspective. That's what I was talking about earlier. We have to have God's perspective. God did not need to come. God created. He is the creator. He's God. That's what makes him different. But God in his love, and because he, he honors the natural rules and the spiritual laws, the natural laws and the spiritual laws, he could not skip laws. He could not skip steps. He, there had to be a perfect atonement. His name was Jesus. There had to be a perfect lamb. His name was Jesus. 
for you and I to reconcile our sins. There was no skipping the cross, but the glory was on the other side of the cross. And so each of us, we have to really understand that as Peter's being challenged, and I'm sure that Peter thought he could do all kinds of things with his life. I'm sure that all the disciples thought their lives were going to be different before they met Jesus, but their lives were forever radically changed because of Jesus. Not only were their lives radically changed and permanently changed and eternally changed, but yours and my lives have been eternally changed because of their commitment and now our renewed commitment to Christ. How beautiful is that? That's an eternal inheritance. An eternal inheritance echoes into eternity. It's not limited to your lifetime, but it goes beyond your lifetime. It's bigger than your lifetime. It's the kingdom of God. So just know this. Whoever's struggling today, whoever feels like they don't have enough or they don't have the right partner in life or they don't have the right friends or they don't have the right car, they don't have the right house, they don't have the right number in their bank account, you know, they don't have the right friends or hobbies, whatever it is, just know that God is still at work. Just know that every sacrifice you make for God, God sees. That every time that you hurt, he hurts. That everything, every time you think you can't get up, he says, get up. And how does, he, how does he have the guts? How does he have the right to get, tell us to get up? Because his son got up out of that tomb so that you could get up out of your gloom. You could get up out of your situation. You don't have to let the devil kill you. you. The Bible says, though I go through the valley, it doesn't say you're staying in the valley. You're growing through the valley. You're getting out of that valley. You're getting out of that valley today. I just love to continue to see Christ's heart for the people. I'm going to go a little bit into Scripture, but I don't have a whole lot of time, so we'll see how we go. I'm going to take us into uh, 1032, verse 32. Jesus' suffering foretold for the third time in the book of Mark. They were on the road and going to Jerusalem. He's making his pilgrimage back home. And Jesus was walking on ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. He will rise again. 35. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able and Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on the right or the left, or on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. 41. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John, calling to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many." Amen. Now, there's not a lot of time, and there's a whole lot of Scripture, so I'm going to focus on the first portion of the Scripture, and we'll settle there and close. Amen? 32, they were on the road going to Jerusalem. So, so as we see chapters 8 through 10, there is a journey that Christ is taking the disciples back to Jerusalem. Christ is on the road to destiny. He's on the road to the cross. He's on the road to the tomb. He's on the road to suffering. He's on the road to being enslaved. He's on the road to be scourged. He's on the road to be humiliated. He's on the road to be taunted. He's on the road to suffer. And he's letting his disciples repeatedly, it seems like he's a broken record, but he's not. He's just really trying to deep seed the fact that there is a process that Christ has to go through and they just 
don't get it. And he wants to make sure that they do. And it says here that Jesus was walking on ahead of them, and they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Saying, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered. Another translation says, Betrayed to the chief priest and the, and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and will betray him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, scourge him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise again. So Christ just repeatedly continues to prepare his disciples. I love what a shepherd does. A shepherd continually is protecting the sheep. I don't know if you realize it or not, but when a sheep wanders off biblically, what the shepherds would do with that sheep is he would leave the 99. <laughs> He'd go after the one. And when he found that sheep, whether it was in a gully, whether it was lost, somewhere in the wilderness, stuck in a bush, whatever it was, he would grab that sheep and he would break its leg. I don't know if you realize that. But shepherds would break the, leaf, break the leg of a sheep that would wander off. And in that time, what would happen is a unique process of intimacy and dependency on the shepherd. Because what would happen is that in the healing process, the, obviously the shepherd would set the leg, so he wasn't killing the sheep. He would set the leg, he would mend it, and then he would carry the sheep over his neck, over his back. And he would have such intimate times with that sheep. As he led the rest of the flock, he would minister to that sheep. He would hand feed that sheep. He would nurture that sheep. He would lift that little sheep up and lower his head and his mouth into the water to drink. How beautiful that God, even when the hardest times in your life, not unlike the sheep, God wants you and draws you closest to him. He is the good shepherd. Even in this scripture, we see that Christ continues. It seems like he like he's being very difficult by repeatedly reminding the disciples of the suffering he's going through. But what he's trying to do is protect his sheep. He's breaking their legs and he's setting it and he's healing and mending it and preparing them for the trials ahead, for the disappointment and the sorrow that they'll experience, for them publicly seeing their Savior humiliated, their Savior bleeding, their Savior whooped, their Savior taunted, people spitting, at him, people trading for his clothes, people gambling with his clothes, people puncturing his side and blood and water pouring out, and for them to experience three days without God, physically on earth, without their Messiah next to them, and them being completely disillusioned. He was trying to protect them as much as he could, but it was a process that was necessary. The leg had to be broken, mended, set, and the relationship strengthened. Christ was preparing his disciples for destiny on the cross. I want to take this moment and close with prayer. Lord, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for your people. I thank you, Lord, that even in the diff most difficult times of our lives, when we thought things were going to happen a certain way, they happened a completely different way. Things that we had, we had to let go of. Lord, all you are doing is making room and processing and perfecting us. I thank you, Lord, that you are so patient, that you're so kind, that you're so loving, that you don't give us what we want as much as we want it, but you give us exactly what we need. I thank you for the Savior that you sent on the earth, Abba Father. I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, that you were willing to humble yourself for a very selfish and, 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 and evil people, God, but you humbled yourself and you sent Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, for everybody on this call and everybody that's called to be saved. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that as, we, as you rose, Lord, that you call us to rise with you and to enter into a new relationship, a new transformation, to enter repentance and welcome the repentance, welcome the pruning, expecting new fruitfulness, Lord. So I speak fruitfulness over every person that's listening right now. I speak fresh pursuit, fresh passion, fresh power. In identity, in Jesus' name, amen.